Good morning. It's very hard to command attention when you're sitting in the back of a very large chair. <laughs> uh, this is Bob Kavner, who many of you remember from last year when he was representing a somewhat different company. And I'm going to have one of these nice, cozy living room chats with Bob Kavner, sort of the way. Your 10th year. Okay. Is your mic on? <laughs> yeah, it's there. on. Okay. We have to move this up, huh? Sure. Should we, I think it should was we tell the audience what this is? On. We have a technology problem. Just try it again where I put it. Okay. It's, it's bending the wrong Did, way. He it, says it's a lady's mic. Does but it I take up in the room now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, welcome back. Thank you. Good the, being here. My first question is, is very simple, and I hope will provoke a long and uh, enlightening answer. Does Hollywood get it? Well, I guess we need to define it in Hollywood, huh? Um, um, if, if you mean by Hollywood, the creative community? Yeah. yeah. The, your clients, in yeah. a word. Oh, I, I think um, um, in the last six months, year, but particularly last six months, there's uh, been a great interest in the creative community. When I use the expression creative community, I'm um, talking about novelists or screenwriters or actors, actresses, uh, and directors. Um, and trying to understand, you know, what this room talked about this morning. Um, and there are a set of creative people, and when I say creative in, that, in, 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 in those venues, that are experimenting um, with uh, new technologies that allow them to express themselves differently. So um, I don't know if they meet the definition of get it yet, but I could report to you um, that um, there's a big learning curve going on in the creative community. Well, if the, I guess the definition of creating, creative people getting it is understanding about interactivity as well as just creating something that's linear and sticks there on somebody's screen? Well, yeah. Uh, I've had oh, hundreds of meetings with people that everyone in the room you know, sees on the screen or produces things on the screen. And um, you, it, it's, it's interesting taking a, um, a screenwriter and showing them what is what you can do on the CD-ROM, and so it, a creative artist, we we have a library probably second to none on on the CD-ROMs that are produced, and we, we do that just to show our the talent, you know, what can be done, and so we kind of sort it in a way to show them different ways of using it, and um, to see some of these minds talk about the product that's out there today and off the same technology base, what can be done with the product is quite enlightening. Um, and we're beginning to see uh, that, have that conversation on online service as uh, at 14.4 and above. Below 14.4, there's not a lot of people come up with as creative ideas, but at 14.4, we're seeing a lot of creative ideas. And on the producer side, getting it means understanding that it's not broadcast. It's not movies, but it's what we were talking about this morning. Yeah, um, you know, you're one of the people, Esther, that, that picked up early that interactivity has as much communications uh, attributes as it does um, information or, or entertainment attributes. And again, in, in the Hollywood creative community, there's that, that beginning discovery that it's not just creating interesting content that would be on the end of the network, but bringing people together that have a common interest, even though they may not know each other. And so that opens up a whole new realm of, uh, of opportunity and, and, uh, and thought for them. But do the, do the producers understand that they're not going to be reaching a mass audience, but perhaps it's something more like the the web we were talking about this morning? Yeah, um, again, I, I, I don't want to misrepresent the audience that, that I think that the, 
the uh, mature creative community in which I joined fully understands that because this room doesn't fully understand it in terms of how to make money. We, um, when we, when we, um, as an example, um, we brought the, uh, the, C the CEOs of the three telephone companies that we are advising, that's Pacific Telesis and uh, Ninex and Bell Atlantic. They came to Creative Artists uh, for a meeting not too long ago, and we brought um, about four of, of, the, of the world's renowned directors and two, two um, most prominent actors and, and, and a, uh, a vocalist uh, to talk. And we didn't know, we didn't have an, it's like your kind of conference, you know, just see what happens when you mix these different personalities together. Um, it, the creative people went right at the subject again that was at this morning. How are we going to make money? You know, we, we think we understand how you guys will make money, but how will we make money? Um, and so, you know, it is, uh, and, and it's a very important subject and one that this room needs to noodle through uh, because this room will have a large influence, probably not control, but an influence over the answer to that question. Um, but it, that question should not take away from what I think is more important is that we are creating a palette for a very new form of creativity. What is on CD-ROM today is Neanderthal man to where it's going to be. And we have not seen the product um, in CD-ROM or online service uh, that people will remember. And you know, I think we're within a year or two of people breaking through with very unique product um, that, that becomes you know, what Jim Manzi's company you know, did to the PC, the Lotus 1, 2, 3. And it's going to have the attributes um, of storytelling in it. Well, if, if it's 1, 2, 3, then it's a, a mass market tool. So it's something that lets people create their own CD-ROMs? Well, I, I, I didn't mean that it would, it's the same economic model as 1, 2, 3, which is a mass market tool. I'm, I was talking about having a product that, that has good uh, storyline and character development um, and um, an ability for people to communicate um, um, in an easy way and that the interfaces are fun and I didn't see what you showed yesterday but a number of people told me uh, that there was a in, uh, very interesting uh, Vietnam product that is shown but it sounds like that is on this yellow brick road yeah. towards innovation in this area. Actually, I should mention uh, for the audience, we talked with David Liddell from Interval Research, and when the product is out, everybody in the audience, and you too, is going to get a copy of it from us and no, from terrific. Interval Research. But I mean, this is actually a very interesting economic difference because yeah. The value of one, two, three, or of some other products from other large companies is precisely that they're standards, and million, the millionth copy is more valuable than the first copy. But in yeah. Hollywood, diversity is valuable. These things have a shorter shelf life, and people want variety, whereas in the other market, people want standards. Well, it. it you know, this phenomenon is being played out in, in the television world. And by the way, uh, can I just make, I mean, I, I'm going, in 1995, I'm like the equivalent of going to graduate school. I, it, I'm not an expert on the entertainment industry. I joined because I wanted to learn it. And so I, I you, you know. know the, more than we do. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know everything that I want to know. Um, and, and I've been spending, uh, which was not anticipated, a lot of time in cable channels. There are a tremendous number of, of uh, proposals out there to create a cable channel. Now, it is in the area you're asking me about in terms of its, it, you know, these are um, market segments that are well identified. A cable channel for single adults, a cable channel for gardeners, a cable channel for um, fashion. Um, and when you start working the economics of that, 
uh, it becomes very difficult you know, to make sure you get the carriage, uh, which, is, which is a difficult thing, and work a new form of a advertising model that is more like a narrow cast advertising model. Therefore, the rate per unit possibly can be higher because you have a, an audience that has a predetermined interest in your subject. Um, and so that is being worked out today. Um, I, I think that that is relevant to this room because if we can be successful in bringing out, successful from an economic standpoint, of bringing out um, channels for special purpose uh, that is profitable and yet meet audience segments and we have an advertising model to build behind it, that same model um, becomes uh, portable into the online environment uh, because you know, we're moving more and more to where we as a customer will hold the auction as opposed to the one who has the product holding the auction. Yeah, but this, so you, you move over the segmentation, but the actual dynamics of it would change some. Yeah, well, because you know, you know, one of the interesting things that I, I learned is on MTV at any given moment, there's no more than a half a million people watching. And yet it sounds it, like a lot to some of us. Yeah. You know, well, it's not. It's not a lot from a television viewing standpoint, but it's a very profitable um, and important uh, venue on television because it, it, it's identified with a generation um, in terms of its brand and, and, and its personality. Um, and I think that that MTV model is uh, portable into other segments. So. First, I asked you whether Hollywood gets it. Now, does this industry get it about Hollywood? Uh, um, well, one, I don't. If I'm representative of the room, and I may not be, um, you know, I went into it with stereotypes that were wrong. So it's quite conceivable, probable, that within this room are stereotypes that are wrong. And, and by the way, they have stereotypes about the room that are that are that are not. Uh, accurate. Um, there, there are two levels of Hollywood. One is the creative community, um, and the others are the studios, the productive uh, the production community. Um, the creative community are filled with incredibly bright, capable people, um, and um, and those human beings, they or the generation behind them that are getting that training will be uh, the creative people working on the venues that some of the people in this room are working on. I mean, there's no question in my mind that the training of, uh, of artists is a training for people who will create wonderful interactive product. Um, that it's, a, it, it's a, a training that has been developed over centuries and, and, it, you know, and the, the rules of storytelling and fantasy uh, the rules of uh, captivating our mind, even from an information standpoint, not just an entertainment standpoint, are f fairly well disciplined. Um, and uh, those people are now looking at what this room is doing. And uh, I think they're beginning to understand it. The interesting thing, and I would, you know, I, I find it interesting as I scan down who is in this room today versus 10 years ago, it's, it's changed dramatically. Well, I would. I would offer, and I'm not a futurist, but over the next several years, you will have a higher mix. You should have a higher mix of creative people. Um, and you and I talk privately about maybe we should have one of the creative people be here. Uh, it, that should be done, because I think we'll all find it very interesting in how they think. And how, you know, if we looked at a CD-ROM product, an online service, and talk to some of the best minds in the creative community. It's eye-opener how they look at it and what they think about it. It's a different set of thoughts than we normally have. And what about the production community? I don't know it that well. You have uh, some people in the room here from Disney and Viacom who probably know it better than I do. Um, you know, one of the, again, one of my stereotypes is that when you thought of uh, Paramount or you thought of MGM or Disney or um, you know, 20th century, you thought of film studios, but as you go into those companies and understand what's in them, that is only one division 
under the management of most of those companies is film, television, publishing, book and magazine, um, and music. And then almost all of them, if not all of them, have interactivity. And so they have a bubbling you know, new department. Now, I think that's significant because the stereotype is what the heck does a film, you know, we won't even need a, a, um, a motion picture lot anymore. We'll, we'll do it in computer animation. But that is a misunderstanding of the assets of those companies. I'm not saying that the management of those companies will all know how to manage the assets going forward, but the, the editing capability, the, the ability of converting a screenplay into something that is compelling um, is very relevant. And they are learning more and more how to move across venue. So they take a product, a storyline, um, that goes into a novel, goes into television, goes into, oh, by the way, theme parks. Most of them have theme parks. Um, and we'll see it move into probably more into uh, gambling environments and things like that. So those companies um, are moving their, their, their competencies across uh, all of the, the venues. Some of them uh, will accomplish that journey and probably be major, major players, notwithstanding the fact that there's probably more niche markets that will get created in that process. I want to pick up on this notion of what a creative asset is. And it, it's also, we were talking earlier how attention is the scarce resource. Right. It's, it's people's attention. And when you had broadcast TV, you could capture people's attention with commercials, even ones that were irritating, perhaps. And there's a lot of equity that's being built up over 10, 15, or even whatever lucky strike was, 50 years. But as the market becomes more fragmented, the, the government's website, according to Mike Nelson, is the most popular. I'm not sure that's because it has the most compelling content, but because it's the government and people know what it is and they pay attention to what it's doing. So it seems to me that the thing that attracts attention now fundamentally is going to be stars. I mean, it's, in the end, people identify most with a human being. Michael Jackson, uh, you know, your list of clients, mm -hmm. they, they end up being the, the only scarce resource that really can't be replicated. I believe that. Um, it's interesting. Uh, we, um, Mike Ovitz, who I, I work with, um, you know, first is, is one of these people with an incredibly broad and creative mind. And uh, in July, when I first arrived there, we were talking about navigation, again, something that was kind of briefly touched upon uh, earlier this morning. And, um, and he came at navigation totally different from at least the way I was thinking about it, and many people around me were thinking about it. Um, he sees navigation being more human-like, uh, either in human-like attributes or, act or in fact being a, a human being. So that when we brought the three telephone companies together um, to form this media company, uh, we went to one of the top personalities in the entertainment industry, who who is a hacker. Who's the guy we mentioned once? Yes, I, okay. I, Esther knows who I'm talking about. He did a film about a, uh, a marriage that didn't make it, so he came back as a uh, the housekeeper. Oh, but, uh, that one. <laughs> and um, so we, we asked if he would, would and, and we, so we told him that we would like to show them a different form of navigation. So he said, I want to be the navigator. Let, you know, meet me at Santa Monica Beach and uh, with a film crew and we'll do a navigator for him. So we went down there in late July and uh, he, he arrived in uh, a sweatsuit and takes off his sweatsuit and he has a bathing suit on and he had a bag of things and one of them was a um, a uh, like a pirate's hat, you know, the three-pointed pirate's hat. And he goes into the ocean and he says, okay, as I start walking out, roll the camera. And we did one take. It was, it, this was not a heavy-duty production. And he, 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 uh, he waves to the camera and says, hi, 
Uh, I'm your navigator. You thought it was an information highway out there. It's not an information highway. It's an information ocean. But I will navigate you through the information ocean. Now, let me just stop there. I sat there and said, my God, he changed the metaphor. Right? And, and uh, an ocean is a, seems to me to be a much better metaphor from what we're talking about than a highway. And then he, I, and then he set up the need for navigation, which is actually a nautical term and not a highway term. And, and then he, he did a routine that, that was fantastic. He said, and I'm going to guide you through the information highway. If you want a, um, you know, a children's show, and he gets into this voice of Barney, and he starts talking, we're going to have the Barney. But if you want to go shopping, you could shop at Barney's, and he gets this kind of st <laughs> uh, stuffy voice of a salesman. And he said, now, if you, uh, if you want to gain information, you can go to the, how do you do it? The, you can go to the Smithsonian Institute on channel so-and-so and learn all about Babylonian Tupperware. <laughs> I mean, it just came out, Babylonian Tupperware. And, and he went through, I mean, he did a Julia Child thing. You take the little chicken legs and spread them like this. <laughs> and he, I mean, he did 15 minutes. Now, we did minimal edits. And we showed it to the three companies who are spending billions building out a broadband network and showed them this form of navigation. We also showed them uh, with voice recognition that, you know, that is coming down the path at the right price point that you could actually guide the navigator. And there was some conversation earlier this morning. So your point about um, stars, or, uh, it, I would strike the word stars, but personality driven. Uh, people you could identify with during different parts of the day. You could have different kinds of navigators depending on the audiences. You as an individual, uh, you could have loaded on the server many navigators and you could select your navigator and I guess it becomes an intelligent agent after a while. But, but that change of paradigm from navigation as icon driven to navigation as human driven I found startling, and what turned out to be our three clients found, I think, very intriguing. Well, maybe we can show that film next year. Okay. Or show that navigator. Um, I'm going to leave the continuation of this particular piece of the conversation to Jerry, but I just want to ask you one more thing, which is what did you learn at AT&T? I asked you about what you learned in Hollywood. What did you learn at AT&T? Well, I, I was at AT&T for 10 years. Uh, I was brought in AT&T right after the divestiture to be the chief financial officer. And uh, as chief financial officer at and I came to your conference in 86 with Vittorio Cassoni. Yeah. Um, because I, you know, I felt at the time that the company being a communications company needed to better understand this burgeoning world of computers, because that's where we were at the time. So I kind of have been traveling uh, this path. Uh, AT&T was traumatized in 84, uh, externally, by the breakup. And uh, because of that trauma, um, everything was up for grabs in terms of reordering the assets, and we reorganized the company, and I think made it um, a, a very healthy, focused business. Um, and even though it's tried to say deploying quality principles on the way. And, um, before I left, I had an organization of 40,000 people um, and was part of the being responsible for AT&T's strategy. Um, I'll tell you a major thing that I, that I learned that it's relevant to a company of 15 as it is 40,000, and it's around this concept of empowerment. The people of AT&T are incredibly capable. They can compete with anyone, and the question for AT&T or any large company or a 15-person company, can you provide the right environment and organize the people and give them the space to do great things and eliminate the barriers? And there were situations which we did you know, terrific. I mean, and a lot of it is in the success. Uh, one uh, that I'll mention here, uh, which was probably my biggest failure at AT&T was in the last year, where I broke that rule on empowerment and that um, 
but Bernie LaCrude and I, and Bernie and Kleiner Perkins, had this idea that we're entering a period where um, a um, handwriting environment could get created, and you know, we put the, assembled the technology pieces and created a company called EO. Now, the rule that I broke is that I, in that CEO of the multimedia business of at and I'm a figurative leader, and I became an advocate on that particular project. And so we obviously got the funding for the project because I wanted to do it. And then I went, you know, I had a ton of other things to do, so I had others carry it out. But the problem was it was always seen as my project because I started it. And it put a spin on the ball in terms of logical thinking within AT&T and how to deal you know, with the challenges that that company faced. And a number of decisions were made in hindsight, I see, because they were trying to do what they thought I wanted them to do. And that when you empower an organization, you should let them know what the objectives are, you know, what the boundary conditions are, and let them go and do it. And I didn't do that. I went way in, started the thing, it became known as mine, and therefore it, you know, it did not succeed because you know, I broke that important rule. Um, so AT&T has taught me you know, a lot of lessons, and one of them is you know, setting up your organization um, to succeed and allowing great people to do good things um, is the rule of leadership. And once you break that, and try to meddle down in there, uh, you can get yourself in trouble. And so I've, I learned by my successes and my failures. Well, did you, did you pick the wrong project or did you make it fail? No, no, I think it was a good project. Uh, and, um, um, but we, it, 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 decisions were made, again, in hindsight, that, that moved it in, in the direction that it landed up in, um, which I think was more reflective of what people thought I would want. Um, it's conceivable to me that the project should have been killed a lot earlier, but gee, that's not what Bob would want. And the only point I'm making is, you know, that in, in a leadership role, we got to be, and those of you who run your companies or run departments or divisions or subsidiaries, you need to be very careful. And when you put your point of view forward, uh, because if you put it forward too far, you know, the organization will use that as a as a point in which uh, they'll hear it as a mandate, and it's not necessary that it's going to be successful. Thanks. Okay. Sounds like somebody asking somebody to kill a priest. <laughs> okay, Jerry, your turn. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, This is the beginning of our panel on virtual places and people, and I'm really excited because the people we have on this panel are diverse, um, each of them uh, fascinating, and I think the interactions will be really spectacular. My job right now is to briefly uh, introduce you to Sherry Turkle, whom you may know as the author of The Second Self, and uh, who teaches at MIT and is currently working on another book. She has been exploring this idea of, of online spaces and personalities firsthand. Uh, she's been in the trenches doing stuff and interacting, and I think you'll find what she has to tell you um, really exciting and startling and remarkable. Um, Sherry, if you'll come up and, and tell us what you'd like. Well, I'm going to try to be exciting. What was the second? Remarkable, remarkable was third. Well, I feel safest in being remarkable by beginning by quoting not from myself, but from a poet. Long before there were computers, internets, or virtual communities, Walt Whitman wrote, there was a child went forth every day, and the first object he looked upon, that object he became. These few lines by a poet, not a social scientist, are the touchstone for my work. They speak to the importance of a psychological and a clinical perspective to the development of the computer culture. We make our objects, and in turn, our objects make us. What are we becoming when the objects we look upon 
often for many of us, the first objects we look upon every day are virtual objects. For the past several years, as Jerry said, I've been involved in an ethnographic and clinical study of people and their virtual selves. This morning, I'm going to try to begin our discussion of virtual people and places by talking about some ways in which virtual experiences can impact on personal identity, and indeed, how it can challenge the very thing, the very construct that we've traditionally called identity. This can happen in many different types of virtual communities. It can happen on America Online. It can even happen in email. In order to make my points very quickly and very dramatically, I'm going to pick uh, a quick and dramatic example uh, which takes some of the issues really to the highest power. So I'm going to be talking about people who are engaged in MUDs or multi-user dungeons where actually they're participating in virtual communities with other people on a regular basis. MUDs, for those of you who don't know, are multi-user dungeons, multi-user domains. You join one very simply through a telnet command that links your computer to a computer that holds the MUD program. It's not difficult to make this connection. It just takes internet access. You create a character, several characters. You specify their genders and other physical and psychological attributes. Then, as that character, you move through virtual spaces in which you meet and are able to communicate in both word and action with other characters. In other words, with other characters who are there in the place of the people behind them. In some MUDs, players are invited to help build the virtual world itself to make places and objects in that space and specify how they look and how they work. So the first MUD player I ever met was an 11-year-old who built a room she called the condo. It's beautifully furnished. She has created magical jewelry and makeup for her dressing table. When she visits the condo, she invites her friends, she chats, she orders a virtual pizza, and she flirts. In other words, she's 13 years old. Other players have more varied social lives. They create characters who have casual and romantic sex, hold jobs, attend rituals and celebrations, fall in love, get married. Now, to say the least, such goings-on are gripping. This is more real than my real life, says one character, who turns out to be a man playing a woman pretending to be a man. <laughs> mud players are mud authors. They're creating as well as consuming the content of their media. So this makes muds a new genre of artistic endeavor with many things in common with performance art, street theater, improvisational theater, commedia dell'arte, and script writing. But MUDs are something else as well, something closer to my area of expertise, because as players participate in MUDs, they're becoming authors not only of the text, but of themselves. Not only of the text, but of themselves. They're constructing themselves through virtual social interaction. So one player says, you are the character and you're not the character, both at the same time. And another adds, you are who you pretend to be. In virtual communities, one's body is represented by textual description. So the obese can be slender, the beautiful can be plain, the nerdy can be elegant and sophisticated. Many of you have seen and joked about the New Yorker cartoon in which one dog says to another, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. The anonymity that's being referred to there that's made possible in virtual communities provides ample room for individuals to express multiple and often unexplored aspects of the self. There's unrivaled opportunity to play with one's identity and to try out new ones. Indeed, as I've suggested, MUDs make possible the construction of an identity that is so fluid and multiple that it strains the very limits of the notion Identity, after all, literally means one, and when we live through electronic self-representations, we have unlimited possibilities to be many. In some ways, the issue of virtual selves provoke a new discourse about identity and authenticity, which run in parallel with some of those that are posed by psychoactive medication. If a patient on Prozac tells his therapist that he feels more like himself with the drug than without it, what does this do to our standard notions of a real self? Where does real life end and a game begin? 
there's a parallel question, is the real self always the, quote, naturally occurring one, the one without the drug, the one without the extension of self in the virtual community? Is the real self always the one in the physical world? As more and more of real business, real business defined as money-making business, let's say, gets done in cyberspace, couldn't be the real self be the self that functions in that realm? In traditional theater and in role-playing games that take place in physical space, one steps in and out of character. MUDs, in contrast, virtual communities in contrast, offer a parallel life. Dedicated MUDs players, for example, are often people who work almost all day with computers at their regular jobs. The job, um, the, uh, the communications program, the MUDs are all on different windows of their computer screen all at the same time. And as people play on MUDs, they periodically put their characters to sleep but remain logged on to the game while they pursue these other activities. From time to time, they return to the game space, and in this way, they break up their day and the game space. And they experience their lives as a cycling through. I like this term, I use it a lot. It's a cycling through the real world, the RL, as it's known in mud parlance, and a series of virtual ones. Some mudders go so far as to challenge the idea of giving any priority to the RL. After all, says one player, why grant such superior status to the self that has the body when the selves that don't have bodies are able to have different kinds of experiences? This kind of cycling through interaction with MUDs is made possible by the existence of windows, which are a way, of course, of working with the computer that makes it possible for the machine to place you in several contexts at the same time. Your identity on the computer you could think of as the sum of your distributed presence. Let me tell a quick case. Doug is a Dartmouth College junior majoring in business for whom a MUD represents one window and real life, or RL, represents another. Doug plays four characters distributed across three different MUDs. One is a seductive woman, one is a macho cowboy type whose self-description stresses that he's a Marlboro's, ro Marlboro's rolled in the t-shirt sleeve kind of guy. That's his character description. Then there's a rabbit of unspecified gender who wanders its MUDs introducing people to each other, a character he calls Carrot. Doug says, Carrot is so low-key that people let it be around while they're having private conversations, so I think of Carrot as my passive, voyeuristic character. Actually, Doug has a fourth and final character, which is one that he only plays on furry muds. Now, these are muds that are known as places of sexual experimentation where all the characters are furry animals. And he says to me, I'd rather not even talk about that character because its anonymity there is very important to me. He says, let's just say that on furry muds, I feel like a sexual tourist. Doug talks about playing his characters in Windows, and he says that using Windows has enhanced his ability to turn pieces of his mind on and off. He says, I split my mind. I'm getting better at it. I can see myself as being two or three or more and I just turn on one part of my mind and then another when I go from window to window. RL, says Doug, is just one more window. And he adds, it's not usually my best one. RL is just one more window and it's not usually my best one. The development of the Windows metaphor for computer, met uh, for computer interfaces was a, a technical motivation, which is motivated by the desire to get people working more efficiently by cycling through different applications. But in practice, in social practice, Windows have become a powerful metaphor for people thinking about the self as a multiple and distributed system. The self is no longer simply playing different roles in different settings, something that people experience when, for example, you wake up as a lover, you make breakfast as a mother, and you drive to work as a lawyer. The life practice of Windows is of a distributed self that exists in many worlds and plays many roles all at the same time. MUDS extends the metaphor. Now RL itself, as Doug says, can be just one more window. 
But mutters don't just become who they play, they play who they are or what they want to be. Players sometimes talk about their real selves as a composite of their characters, and they sometimes talk about their mud characters as a means of working on their RL lives. For some people, MUDs provide what the psychoanalyst Eric Erickson would have called a psychosocial moratorium. This notion of the moratorium was a central element in how Eric Erickson thought about identity development, particularly in adolescence. And although the term moratorium means literally a timeout, what Erickson had in mind was not withdrawal. On the contrary, the adolescent moratorium is a time of intense interaction with people and ideas. It's a positive, active phase of life. It's a time of passionate friendships and experimentation. The moratorium is not on significant experiences, but on their consequences. Now, what does this sound like? This sounds like life on the internet. This sounds like life on the screen. It's a time of passionate friendships, passionate experimentation, but without consequences. It's a time during which one's actions in adolescence, for example, in his example, are not counted. So free from consequence, experimentation becomes the norm rather than a brave departure. Consequence-free experimentation facilitates the development of a core self, a personal sense of what gives life meaning that Erickson called identity. Now, Erickson developed these ideas about the importance of a moratorium during the 1950s and early 1960s. At that time, the notion corresponded to a common understanding of what the, quote, college years were about. Today, 30 years later, the idea of the college years as a consequence-free time out really seem of another era. College is pre-professional, and AIDS has made consequence-free sexual experimentation impossibility. The years associated with adolescence no longer seem a time out. But if our culture no longer, if our RL no longer offers an adolescent moratorium, virtual communities do. It is part of what makes them seem so attractive. Erickson's ideas about stages did not suggest rigid sequences. His stages describe what people need to achieve before they can easily move ahead to another task. For example, Erickson pointed out that successful intimacy in young adulthood is difficult if you don't come to it with a sense of who you are, which is, of course, the challenge of the stage before, the stage of adolescent identity building. In real life, however, people frequently move on with serious deficits. With incompletely resolved stages, they simply do the best they can. They use whatever materials they have at hand to get as much as they can of what they have missed. MUDs, life on the internet, are dramatic examples, offer dramatic examples of how technology is coming to play a role in these everyday dramas of self-reparation. Time in cyberspace reworks the notion of a vacation, and it reworks the notion of a moratorium because they may now exist in an always available window. From my point of view, for thinking about identity in a culture of simulation, the citizens of MUDs are our pioneers. I'd like to end with a personal story about my life on a MUD. One day, I came across a reference to a character called Dr. Sherry. This was a cyber psychotherapist. I'm a psychotherapist who has an office in the rambling house that constitutes this particular MUD's virtual geography. There, I'm told, Dr. Sherry administers questionnaires and interviews people about their experiences on MUDs and the psychology of mudding. Now, I have every reason to believe that the name Dr. Sherry refers to my 15-year career as a student of the psychology of technology. But I didn't create Dr. Sherry. Dr. Sherry is me, but she's not mine. Dr. Sherry is a character created by another player. 
On the mud, my character has another name, and I don't give out questionnaires and conduct interviews. My methodology for doing my work is I sort of insist that I don't report on anyone unless I have them in a very, very traditional RL, face-to-face -face clinical setting. So I'm not Dr. Sherry. She's a character name that somebody else created in order to quickly communicate an interest in this kind of stuff and a certain set of questions about technology and the self. So I experienced Dr. Sherry as a piece of my history spinning out of control. I try to quiet my mind. I tell myself that one's books, one's public and intellectual persona are pieces of oneself in the world for other people to use as they please. Surely this virtual appropriation is kind of the highest form of flattery. But my disquiet continues because Dr. Sherry, after all, isn't an inanimate book or an object in the world. She's a person, or he's a person, or at least it's a person behind a character who's meeting with others in the world, in the mud world at least. I mean, I get myself all confused and I talk my disquiet over with a friend who raises the conversation stopping question, well, would you prefer if Dr. Sherry were a bot? Now, this is an intelligent computer program, an agent, an artificial intelligence agent that roams this mud. Um, would I prefer if it was a bot, an artificial intelligence, that was trained to interview people about life on the mud? This had not occurred to me, but in a flash, I realized that this, too, is possible. It's even likely to be the case, because many bots or puppets roam this mud. Characters played by people are often mistaken for these little artificial intelligences. In fact, Doug, the college junior who I just quoted to you, has this character, Carrot, who's often mistaken for a robot because the character is so passive. And I myself have made this mistake with a bot called Julia when she offered me directions or remembered my name. I was kind of flattered into thinking that this had, was a real person and had an embarrassing moment or two until I figured out that it was a robot. So I'm confronted with a double that could be a person or a program. It's kind of new take on Philip Roth's problem in Operation Shylock. The Dr. Sherry story dramatizes how computational experiences, and in fact, Dr. Sherry wasn't a robot or a person, it was a group of three people who together created a character. So even on MUDs, you can have multiple personalities in one character itself. The Dr. Sherry story I, I tell and I share with you because for me it dramatizes yet another way in which computational experiences can serve as evocative experiences for thinking about human identity in a culture of simulation and about a whole new world of relationships that we're going to have with machines, artificial intelligences, and virtual others. People decide that they want to interact with others in a multi-user computer environment. They think they'll have new access to people and information, and there's little question that they do. But then they find themselves in a mud. They find themselves assuming multiple persona on computer networks. They're swept up in experiences which challenge their ideas about a unitary self. They meet their double, and it's a cyborg. One way of summing all of this up is to say that experiences on the internet bring postmodernism down to earth. And as I've said, for thinking about identity in a culture of simulation, the citizens of MUDS are our pioneers. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask our other three panelists to please come up and uh, join us up here. That was a wonderful introduction to the nature of identity and character out there in this uh, strange space.